How's it going guys? It's Than from Tidal Gardens. I haven't done a tank video in a really long time, mostly because I'm a hermit, but I did manage to get out of my pajamas and visit my friend Will. I'm really glad that I did, because what I saw there got me thinking about my own systems quite a bit. Will's tank is made by Elos, and it's their complete setup with tank, stand, sump, and skimmer. Everyone's always curious to see what's under the hood, so let's cover the equipment before I talk about the livestock. To maintain water quality, this system employs a protein skimmer and occasionally runs ozone. Will told me that he doesn't really run ozone often because his water tests very high in oxidative reductive potential, abbreviated as ORP, which is correlated with water cleanliness. At some point I'm going to have to give ozone its own video but for now, um, let's just say that it's a way to break down yellowing compounds in the water and supercharge a protein skimmer. It's a lot more than that, but different video. In addition to skimming, ozone, and water changes, this system employs a dosing pump to add calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and a carbon supplement to lower phosphates and nitrates in the water. For lighting, Will is using two Kessel LED lights. All of this is managed by a single Neptune controller. For water flow, there is both a return pump as well as an Ecotec MP40 mounted to the sidewall of the aquarium. Will even has this interesting magnifying glass that's also magnet mounted to get a closer look at the aquarium inhabitants. Speaking of the tank inhabitants, let's take a look around. The obvious thing to my eye is the sea apple. A sea apple is not something that I would recommend for most hobbyists. It's a variety of filter feeding sea cucumber that's incredible to look at. Now it does kind of come with a pretty bad downside. When they die, they take the whole tank with it. These sea cucumbers are known for releasing toxins upon death that are potent enough to kill absolutely everything. So yeah, the sea apple, you can kind of think of it as a very colorful hand grenade sitting in your tank. There are some warning signs a few days in advance, so if you were to catch it in time, you can remove the soon to be dead sea apple before it goes nuclear. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it's a really big risk having one of these things in your tank. So be sure you know what you're getting yourself into before purchasing one. Will did a ton of reading on them before deciding to pick his up. I personally have never owned one, and I'll go ahead and enjoy this one from afar. As for the rest of the tank, it's a mixed reef. A mixed reef is basically one that has a mix of soft corals such as these paleothoa polyps, xenia, rhodactus mushrooms, neon green nephthia, as well as stony corals ranging from acans, to hammer corals, and even to some SPS like this Acropora. The thing that stood out about this tank to me was the health of two corals in particular. The first was the aforementioned Acanthastria. For whatever reason, these corals sometimes struggle at my greenhouse, so it was crazy to see this specimen here. I sold this to Will months ago. The polyps on this guy are the size of 50 cent pieces. They're like five times larger than what I typically see at my place. The second coral that stood out was this red Ganiopora. We're lucky enough to be able to grow these Australian Ganis, but mine don't look anything like this one, which is a tad ironic because this too came from Tidal Gardens. I sold him this, but it looked completely different when I owned it. The polyp extension and the overall growth of this colony is just simply incredible. The appearance of these two corals got me looking into what are the main differences between what Will does with his tank and what we do at the greenhouse. The obvious difference that came to mind was the carbon dosing. If you recall, the dosing pump in the stand dosed the three major trace elements, but it also dosed a carbon supplement. Carbon dosing is another one of those topics that warrants its own video, but in short, it's a way hobbyists can lower nitrate and phosphate in an aquarium 
by growing bacteria that feed off of this carbon. The carbon source, which is sometimes ethanol-based or sugar-based, promotes the growth of these bacteria that consume phosphates and nitrates, and then in turn are skimmed out by the protein skimmer. Thus, the overall levels of phosphate and nitrate are brought down. That's the short version. Now, I never really considered carbon dosing because in my systems, there's undetectable levels of both phosphate and nitrate. And that's not really so much of a boast, but more just the reality of having a thousand gallon system with like three fish in it. The bio load is so low that phosphates and nitrate build up, it's just not really a thing. What I failed to consider though, is that there's a lot of studies now about how corals use bacteria as a food source. Many corals, in fact, can acquire almost all of their nutritional needs from eating the bacteria that's growing on their mucus coat. In some cases, even more than what they would get from photosynthesis. Also, the nitrogen and phosphorus that they ingest helps maintain healthy populations of zooxanthellae that require it. I've even read that the way that certain corals grow is intended to maximize the growing potential of bacteria between its branches by slowing down the incoming flow of water. It's like we're trying to farm coral, and the coral are in turn trying to farm bacteria. It's really wild stuff that I'm just scratching the surface of now. Seeing this tank really got me thinking about my own, and I've already started playing around with carbon dosing. If I get the results that even come close to what I'm seeing here, I'm gonna be thrilled. And that pretty much does it for this tank. Thanks go out to Will for having me over and letting me film. I look forward to the next build for sure. Thanks to you for watching, and like always, happy reefing.